Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We're going to get started now. Today we have approximately 30 minutes and as a reminder, one question, one follow-up. We have Dr. Moore here today, so I'll turn it over to him for some brief remarks. Good afternoon everyone. Bon après-midi à tous. Good afternoon everyone. There are 587 new cases of COVID-19 in Ontario. There are 279 people in hospital and 149 in the intensive care unit due to COVID-related critical illness. And I'm sorry to say that there have been another six deaths that have been reported. Our vaccination rate continues to climb. Currently, 86.7% of eligible Ontarians have one dose and 81.8% have two doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. A total of 37,057 tests were processed yesterday with a positivity rate of 1.7%. We're moving closer to our target of 90% of eligible Ontarians vaccinated, which will help to slow the transmission of the Delta variant. Thanksgiving is coming up, a special time of year for many Ontarians, and an opportunity to show appreciation and gratitude. I am only too aware of the negative impacts and the social isolation can have and the need to spend time with our loved ones. That is why we want families to embrace the opportunity to get together for their mental, physical and social well-being. Last year, Thanksgiving looked very different for many of us. In-person celebrations were limited to immediate households and virtual celebrations became more common. But thanks to our collective efforts to get vaccinated and to follow public health guidance, we are able to ga gather together with friends and family to celebrate Thanksgiving this year, provided public health measures are followed. Pour beaucoup parmi nous, le... Many of us uh, on Thanksgiving was a bit different last year. Uh, celebrations in person were reserved for the uh, people in the same household and celebrate uh, virtual celebrations became much more widespread but thanks to the uh, uh, efforts for all ontarians uh, who got vaccinated and followed the public health uh, uh, suggestions we are able to gather with families and friends to celebrate uh, thanksgiving this year first of all that all health measures are followed host an in-person social gathering this year remember that under step three of the roadmap to reopen you can have up to 25 people indoors and 100 people outdoors but the fewer people who gather the lower the risk of transmission and outdoor gatherings are always safer, so use outdoor spaces whenever possible. When gathering outdoors with a group of fully vaccinated individuals, no face covering or physical distancing is necessary. But if you are gathering outdoors with people from multiple households who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, or their vaccination status is unknown, please consider wearing a face covering if physical distancing cannot be maintained. And when gathering indoors with a group of fully vaccinated individuals, you could consider removing your face covering if everyone is comfortable. But if you gather indoors with people from multiple households who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, or you don't know whether they've been vaccinated, you should wear a face covering and physically distancing. And when we gather inside with a group of people who are fully vaccinated, it's possible for you to leave, uh, to take off your uh, face covering if everyone agrees. But if you gather inside with people who come from many households that are non-vaccinated, partially vaccinated, or of which the status is unknown, you should have a face covering and keep your distance. You can wear a face covering and physically distance if you feel it is right for you, especially, or especially if you or others are immune compromised or at high risk of severe disease or exposure to COVID-19. No one should attend a Thanksgiving or other social gathering if they are sick. 
even if people have mild symptoms. Please stay home and get tested. Make your event as safe as possible. You should also provide hand sanitizer, soap and water for your guests to wash their hands frequently, cover your coughs or sneezes if possible, keep the windows open to increase ventilation, and ensure high touch surfaces are cleaned and disinfected. Halloween is also around the corner, and I know our kids are eager to fill up their bags and pillowcases with candy. So I did want to share a few measures that people should consider as they prepare for Halloween. Trick or treating should take place outdoors as much as possible. Be creative. Fashion a face covering into your Halloween costume design. But remember, a costume mask is no substitute for a proper face covering. Do not overcrowd the doorsteps. Take turns and keep interactions brief. Maintain physical distancing as much as possible. Halloween arrive bientôt. Halloween is coming soon, and I know that our children want to fill their bags and their pillowcases with candy, and that's why I have some measures to share with you that people should take uh, into account in their preparations for Halloween. Uh, that should be done uh, uh, outdoors and be creative. Integrate a uh, face covering to your Halloween costume, but uh, a mask for your costume is not, uh, cannot replace properly a face covering. Don't be too many at the door and one, go one by one and don't expect. For treaters who might be considering attending or throwing a Halloween party all the guidance that I had uh, previously outlined for Thanksgiving and other social gatherings applies to you too. And it bears repeating, if you are sick, even with mild symptoms, you should not be participating in social events like Halloween. We know from experience it is exactly these kinds of events that can lead to spikes in transmission. But provided we do our best to follow the guidelines in place, we can enjoy some well-deserved time with friends and family while also keeping our community transmission low. I also wanted to address different kinds of events, and today it's about weddings. We have noticed a number of outbreaks associated with weddings, in particular wedding receptions. I know that getting married is a special moment for couples and their families and that no one wants uh, COVID-19 as one of the guests. It's imperative that public health measures are followed to ensure the health and safety of the happy couple and their friends and families. Also note that while the current regulation states individuals who are not fully vaccinated attending wet a wedding reception in a meeting or event space can provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test in order to attend, this exemption expires on Tuesday. This means that as of Wednesday, October 13th, proof of vaccination or an eligible exemption will be required. Il est un aussi. Uh, it's also to note that presently people who are invited to a wedding reception uh, must uh, show a proof of a COVID test negative to be uh, able to go. But that exemption comes to an end on Tuesday. That means that starting on Wednesday, 13th of October, the proof of vaccination or of an ex admissible exemption is needed. Continue to call on Ontarians to make sacrifices, to change habits, and to be vigilant. And the last 20 months have been challenging and stressful at times, even distressing. I sincerely hope that you are able to spend time with loved ones this weekend, whether in person or virtually, and to relax, reflect, and give thanks. And if you haven't already, please take the time to get vaccinated this weekend, this Thanksgiving, a vax giving. And as we head into this Thanksgiving weekend, I want to take a moment to express my gratitude and my thanks to all of you. And once it will start the Thanksgiving weekend, I take this occasion to express to you my thanks and my thanks. Uh, 
I'm thankful for your continued efforts to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in Ontario. And thanks to you, we are managing to keep the fourth wave under control. Thank you. Merci. And with that, Thank you. one additional comment. Today, we have released uh, further information about our third dose strategy in Ontario. We have released a guideline with a list of immune compromising medications that will make individuals taking these medications eligible for the third dose. And also, we're expanding uh, to all retirement homes and elderly congregate living settings, not just long term care facilities those living in those institutions and areas uh, the ability to get their third dose. Updated guidelines are on the Ontario.ca website as we speak and we'll be implementing this with our public health, um, retirement home, um, primary care partners and pharmacists over the coming days. Thank you. We'll go to the phone lines. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Over to the first question, please. Your first question comes from Allison Jones with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Well, hi, Dr. Moore. Um, I just wanted to ask about Halloween to start. I noticed that one of the um, bullet points in the guidance is for kids not to sing or shout um, for their treats when trick-or-treating. Just curious uh, how you envision um, that going. Kids generally go to the doors and shout trick-or-treat. Should they just not be speaking at all? Oh, no, I mean, they'll have masks on. It's just not to yell too exuberantly. I think the purpose of that comment was not to aerosolize, uh, and it's uh, just a risk reduction strategy. Uh, clearly, you have to make your presence known to get your treat, and you have to be able to knock as well as ask for the treat. Uh, we just ask not with a high volume uh, that could potentially aerosolize. It's an abundance of caution, uh, and uh, uh, last year when Halloween was present in Kingston uh, and I was giving out candies, um, kids were great. Uh, and the event went smoothly without any uh, issues uh, and uh, the children were all reasonable and lined up appropriately. So I certainly hope across Ontario it goes well again uh, this year. Follow-up? Thanks. Um, on another topic, um, we're starting to see workers in hospitals and long-term care homes lose their jobs over the mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policies. Likely we'll see even more of that over the next few months. Are you worried about the impact that these staffing shortages could have in the middle of a pandemic? With any policy, we absolutely worry about unintended consequences uh, of uh, any policy. Uh, and um, certainly we're watching that situation closely. We've watched where it's been fully implemented across the health sector in Quebec and in British Columbia. Um, I'm saddened uh, that individuals um, um, won't get immunized. I think as a healthcare worker anywhere, you're working in a high-risk environment, whether it's long-term care, acute care, it's your personal obligation to be vaccinated to protect the patients you serve uh, and you provide care for. Uh, and I believe strongly in that. Uh, and I'm happy to say the vast majority of healthcare workers have come forward because they feel obligated to protect them, their families and friends as well. Um, there are a small percentage uh, that aren't and I'm very saddened um, that uh, the potential of losing their jobs coming forward, it is absolutely not our intent. Our intent uh, through these policies are that they embrace the opportunity to be immunized, to protect themselves Themselves, to protect their families, to protect the patients uh, that they are honored to care and serve. Uh, and, and that is uh, our uh, an entire wish, uh, is that they become immunized. These vaccines are safe. They are exceptionally effective at minimizing individuals' risk to get uh, the symptoms of COVID-19, as well as the risk to get hospitalized in the intensive care unit. Uh, a major reason why these uh, vaccines are important for healthcare workers as well uh, is, is that um, uh, healthcare workers are essential. Uh, and to have anyone off because they've been exposed or because they've gotten the infection uh, takes time away from care uh, and has negative impacts as well. So all of these policies, they need balance. Uh, I am saddened that some workers haven't come forward to be immunized. Um, but uh, in some settings, it's absolutely essential that they be immunized. And we must learn from the long-term care sector uh, the deaths that have occurred there uh, and further prevent illness. Next question. Your next question comes from Lorenda Redikoff with CBC. Please go ahead. 
Hi there, Dr. Moore. Many doctors are still refusing to see people in person and not sending patients to the ER. What's your reaction to what's happening and what is your advice to doctors? And finally, have they been sent directives on this? Um, so great question. We haven't sent directives. Um, I have sent a letter in partnership with the College of Physicians and Surgeons Ontario in particular regarding uh, um, uh, frontline uh, health care workers, primary care workers in particular, uh, being able to see patients in person. Uh, I do think uh, we need a balance between the, the percentage of patients we see virtually and that we see in person. Uh, there's so many nuances to an interaction when you see someone in person uh, that is lost uh, uh, during virtual care. Uh, and certainly for the provision of vaccines for uh, basic cancer screening, such as pap smears, um, uh, all of that needs to get done uh, in person. Uh, and we don't need further delays in the provision of the basic vaccines uh, and or basic cancer screening or physical examinations that need uh, to take place. So it does need to be balanced. Uh, I do um, strongly encourage our primary care partners uh, to have a balance within their practices uh, and, and we're monitoring um, through billing uh, that proportion uh, that's occurring and hopefully we're going to see an increase um, given that the vast majority of our population uh, who's eligible has been immunized and given that we have very good infection prevention control practices in primary care settings. Uh, it's certainly my hope uh, that more physicians are providing direct uh, in-person care. Um, I think that's essential um, for the health of Ontarians uh, and for the patient-physician relationship. Um, uh, and uh, essential screening. Uh, so there's no directive that's been written, but it's certainly uh, uh, encouraged by our office in partnership with the college. The impact on emergency departments, we monitor emergency department visit volume uh, in almost real time, uh, and the eMERGE volumes are right back at around 20,000 visits a day across Ontario, um, which is a high volume, high impact, uh, and uh, at, uh, they're probably very much at their maximum uh, right now in emergency medicine. So the more the system works cohesively and collectively, uh, the better off we'll be able to serve our patients and minimize the impact on emergency departments and the acute care sector. Follow-up? We've been seeing Ontario's case numbers and hospitalizations dip while it's a much different situation in other provinces. What do you attribute the drop here in Ontario and how much do you see as connected to lockdown measures and restrictions here. Uh, uh, thank you for that question as well. Uh, and as it's Thanksgiving, I have to thank Ontarians for um, having been wonderful in prevention. I, I do think it's a balance between having high immunization rates and adhering to just the basic public health measures. Uh, and Ontarians deserve thanks and, and simply praise, as certainly from me, um, be because uh, we're able to keep our rates of illness low, some of the lowest in, in North America um, as a number of cases per 100,000. So uh, we're, we're at roughly 86 um uh, percent of our population, over 86 percent of our population has had their first doses who are eligible, uh, and we're adhering to masking, we're adhering to distancing, we're practicing good hand hygiene, we're screening now. Uh, if you're going to a, a, a family setting, whether the person's been vaccinated, whether you have symptoms, and we're all adhering to precaution and prevention, and that's keeping Ontarians safe. Uh, and all I can say is thank you, keep doing what you're doing, it's working. I do think that the certification, um, process that we're putting in play to make going indoor safer for restaurants and for high-risk venues like mass gatherings at, at a sports game is also going to keep Ontarians safe in the long term. We've got a, a long fall and winter ahead of us. The, the weather is changing, the leaves are changing, uh, and we must keep this momentum up. But uh, from me on Thanksgiving weekend coming up, my heartfelt thanks. Uh, Ontarians are doing the right things, uh, and it's um, uh, the proof is in the pudding. Our our counts are uh, reasonable uh, and our impact on our hospital partners, our hardworking nurses, uh, respiratory tech, uh, techs, physicians, uh, ambulance, uh, it is um, having an impact in allowing them to provide um, um, and restore uh, some of the healthcare services that we haven't been able to provide in the last year and a half. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep doing what you're doing, Ontarians. We're heading in the right direction. Next question. Your next question comes from Brian Lilly with the Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. 
Hey, Dr. Moore, I, I'd like you to look back to a year ago and where you were both as a um, medical officer for Kingston, but also where the province was. A year ago, you were advocating for people to have uh, just you know, stay within your own family unit, within your own household, have virtual celebrations. Um, this year, it's a bit more loose, but we actually have more people in, in hospital than we did a year ago. We've got similar case counts. What's the difference between now and then in terms of how the province and public health authorities are reacting? Uh, I think an 86.7% immunization uh, uh, rate in Ontario is what's allowing that to happen. Uh, I, I think one of the first questions as you move indoors for a Thanksgiving event should be, um, uh, is everyone here vaccinated? Uh, if, they're, uh, if they're vaccinated, the next question you should be asking, uh, have you got any symptoms compatible with COVID-19? If you have fever, cough, uh, flu-like symptoms, muscle aches, joint aches, uh, you should not attend. Uh, and uh, then you can proceed indoors with good hand hygiene, distancing, masking if you so choose, if you're vulnerable to this virus like immune suppressed. Um, so we've learned in the last year and a half um, how to uh, minimize the risk of COVID-19. And that took us a year and a half to build all of that knowledge base up. And now in addition, uh, th those are ingrained in our behaviors. Uh, but now in addition, we have a, a high level of protection through very safe and effective vaccines, which is enabling us and I'm, I'm so thankful that we can have in-person Thanksgiving going forward, and I think it will be safe, and I think Ontarians will follow the rules uh, and will um, uh, prevent further uh, transmission over the, uh, this long weekend uh, because we've been good at applying these basic principles, uh, and uh, we've learned them over the year and a half, and now uh, they've become part uh, of our uh, uh, normal functioning uh, to, to ask these questions, even in a family setting, and to apply them. Uh, and a change in behavior and maintaining that behavior um, will only keep us safer as we head to further celebrations and so looking forward to, to Christmas and to New Year's uh, um, um, uh, and having them occur safely in Ontario as well. So great question. I, I, I applaud Ontarians um, why we can do this more safely now uh, with the addition of the protection of safe and effective vaccines. Follow up. So on that note, we've got, as you said, a, just almost 87% first dose, 80, almost 82% second dose. Um, we've got the vaccine passport certificates, whatever you want to call them, in place. A lot of small businesses, in particular in the hospitality sector, restaurants, bars, and so on, are saying, look, patio season is either over, depending on where you are in the province, or about to be over Shouldn't we be able to increase capacity limits given restrictions that you you have to be fully vaccinated to enter these establishments? We've got the the passport system in place. Why can we have? You know, I was I was at a Jays game last week with uh, twenty nine thousand of my closest friends. Uh, the Senators and Leafs are playing this weekend in Toronto with nearly ten thousand people indoors. Why should a restaurant that is normally at about 50 uh, people pre-COVID be reduced to 25 or less in the current situation? Are you looking at increasing capacity? Yeah, so we're following the data, uh, as you know, uh, on our daily basis um, uh, and looking at um, removing public health measures over time that make sense, uh, that remain safe, because we don't want to uh, step backwards. We only want to step forwards. Uh, and um, public health measures are reviewed uh, regularly, whether they uh, need to be kept, um, whether um, they should be following a risk-based approach, whether we should be anticipating a rise over the next couple of weeks of increase in cases. I certainly hope not. I, I do trust Ontarians to do the right things this weekend. Um, they've, they've proven um, after the September long weekend that um, we didn't have a significant rise in cases. Uh, but I want to assure businesses we look at this data on a regular basis um, and that the government is um, only holding public health measures if necessary. Um, yes, we've been slow and cautious and conservative in Ontario, uh, but it has worked for us uh, and we only want to move in one direction. So 
please bear with us um, uh, as we monitor the data going forward. But uh, I assure you these uh, issues are discussed uh, regularly uh, of how and when we can so safely open up. Uh, and I think we've done so safely and cautiously uh, and will continue to do so uh, monitoring the data. Next question. Your next question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Doctor. On Tuesday, you were uh, speaking of that perhaps we need a review of uh, vaccine exemptions because you were saying anecdotally you were hearing they might be on the high side considering how many people uh, statistically have these conditions that qualify for an exemption. So what did you have in mind there? How would it be carried out? Um, do we need a better system to keep an eye on this? Um, so the, the certification validation process uh, is a process um, that is to best protect Ontarians. Uh, there, there will always be some medical exemptions that will be accepted. Um, th that, that's at a frequency that's relatively known given uh, the incidences that occur. Uh, uh, from a population vantage point, we want, uh, uh, we trust most Ontarians to adhere to these rules. We trust the medical uh, and nursing um, professionals that are filling out these forms to do their best to fill it out. Uh, it's proving to be safe as we move indoors. We haven't seen significant outbreaks where we've got the validation and certification process in place. So from my vantage point, the system's working. Um, yes, there may be, uh, you know, uh, it's brought constantly back to us about the risk of fraud, the risk uh, of medical exemption. But from my vantage point, the system is working. Uh, the vast majority of Ontarians are following the rules. The vast majority of businesses are. Uh, and I think our numbers are showing that as this slow and steady decline in risk. Uh, I also just have to uh, uh, thank our local public health colleagues uh, who are uh, ha have been excellent at uh, case and contact management who have been keeping uh, the risk low in our communities because um, uh, our communities are coming forward if they have symptoms they're getting tested uh, and uh, public health is supporting those individuals that are positive with very rapid um, uh, case and contact management and and that together with high immunization rates is is keeping us uh, safe as well as these validation and certification processes. Follow-up? Yes, thanks, Doctor. Uh, and just to follow up on that, there's been a fair amount of controversy this week about two of 70 MPPs in one party caucus at Queen's Park with exemptions, which is, you know, statistically very high. And I'm wondering if you're worried that, uh, that this... Uh, that's a bad example or if it raises concerns in your mind uh, about um, uh, those exemptions because it is, uh, you know, that is a high rate, 1 in 35. No, I, I have no concerns at present. Uh, I just have to applaud the legislature uh, from having an immunization policy. I had to show my immunization to come in here with my uh, driver's license. The process is working. Um, the vast majority of individuals uh, in this building would be immunized and or have an exemption. Uh, that is what we want our businesses to be able to, uh, to adopt uh, to keep these closed spaces um, uh, and environments safe. Uh, so I have to applaud them for having the policy in the first place. Um, there, uh, the statistical uh, risk uh, uh, remains exceptionally low. Uh, uh, people still, if they uh, have an exemption, would be monitoring for symptoms of COVID-19. They would get tested if they have symptoms. Uh, and, and so uh, no systems fail proof, uh, but we have the backups uh, for um, pr uh, protecting our communities as we go indoors and we go into different venues. Uh, and from my vantage point, generally across Ontario, Ontario, um, the system is working. Last question. Your final question comes from Julianne Lamarack with Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Oui, bonjour, Dr. Moore. Uh, Good morning, Dr. Moore. Uh, who are you, Dr. Moore? Are you afraid of a uh, height in cases in a few weeks following the celebration? I don't think I understood the whole question. And see if you can, uh, if you're comfortable answering in front. I was asking if you were afraid of a rise in the number of cases in 10 days or 12 days uh, after the gatherings this weekend. Are we? Uh yes. 
after each uh, weekend, uh, special uh, uh, festivities. And weekends like Thanksgiving, each day we will follow the data uh, to be sure that there's no uh, 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 increase in cases. No. Quebec is keeping of, of how many healthcare workers remain unvaccinated in the province. Is Ontario doing the same? And if so, do you have the number? And again, if you're comfortable, please answer in French. Okay, so um, I so that the anglais. It's going to be in English, unfortunately. Term care, uh, I do believe they've made the data publicly available on the um, ministry website. Uh, and so they wanted to be transparent and accountable. And they've set the set date of when uh, a worker um, must be uh, immunized by. And I think that's November 15th. Uh, for acute care, I, 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 that's each hospital would have that data. I don't believe it's aggregated yet. Um, but for the long-term care, they've been quite accountable and transparent with those numbers. Um, the Ontario Hospitalization or the Ontario Hospital Association may have the data specific to each hospital corporation in Ontario. Uh, generally speaking, though, the, in the acute care sector, the numbers are in the uh, mid to high 80s. Um, uh, certainly, we'd like to see it higher, um, but um, that number seems to be increasing uh, day by day. Thanks, everyone.